Hello and uh, welcome to our home here at 1111 East Broad. Uh, my name is Napoleon Bell and I'm the Executive Director with the City of Columbus Community Relations Commission. And we'd like to welcome you to another one of our series of Lunch and Learns that we have here in this building at 1111 East Broad. Um, this one is Building Intergenerational Communities uh, and this one we are focusing on the workplace. And so this is something that as you know as the City of Columbus grows, uh, we all get older, but also very uh, more diverse. And so this is something that, uh, am, am, that we as a city, you know, sometimes struggle with, uh, but also how, so how do we work with uh, persons of all ages uh, at, at home, in the workplace, and in other areas, and also the very variety of communities that we have here in the city of Columbus. So we're real happy to bring uh, forth a great panel here to have a discussion with, and also a great audience that I know will have uh, plenty of questions uh, to, to ask throughout the day. Um, also, I would like to, um, first of all, thank um, uh, our, our staff who, who works hard on this and our committee of, this, of the Community Relations Commission. Uh, we have Gail Gray, who I know you've heard from uh, earlier here, and then we have Neil Simler here that's been taking pictures and working on this also, and our whole education committee uh, uh, that has been put a lot of work into determining what our forums are going to be and, and the topics and, and making sure that they happen. Um, I'd also like to introduce our chair of our commission. As you know, we have 23 commissioners that give guidance and direction to our office. And uh, our, our chair of the commission is, is right back there, uh, Miss uh, uh, Dr. Mary Howard, uh, and she's with OSU, and uh, she's the chair of our commission. So she is always here supporting uh, the work that we do. <laughs> and then um, uh, also, uh, you know, I'm not going to be up here asking the questions. Uh, we're going to have one of our other commissioners are going to be involved in that, and uh, you'll be hearing from her in just uh, a, a few moments. Before we get to that, though, I just want to let everyone know a little bit about what our office does as a commission, because sometimes we put on these programs for education-wise, but don't understand truly the, the breadth of what our office does. And very quickly, uh, our office, we, we, we enforce a civil rights code for the city of Columbus in the area of housing, employment, and public accommodations. Secondly, we house a New Americans initiative, working with the refugee and immigrant populations here in the city of Columbus, helping them navigate city services, county services, nonprofits, but making sure that they get up on their feet as quickly as possible, as they, we are a welcoming city here in, in, in the city of Columbus. Uh, also, we work in the area of uh, diversity and cult cultural competency training and inclusion, uh, working both internally uh, with, with the city of Columbus and also police and, and, and fire forces, but also externally out into the general community. And then we also work in the area of community engagement to see how we can network communities together to really help them become autonomous and, and be able to work on issues themselves and short-term and long-term problem solving. And then uh, an area that, that we've had a lot of work in just recently is, is police community relations. Uh, we work in that arena uh, to help build those bridges and understanding of both the community of police and police of community. So those areas you can connect with our office on if you have any questions in that area or if you need assistance within your community, our office would be more than glad to help with that. Uh, so without further ado, we want to get on with our panel discussion. And so I would like to bring up uh, one of our commissioners, uh, a very engaged commissioner with our office, Commissioner Allison Poyer. Please give a round of applause. and I will be the moderator uh, for our Lunch and Learn today. Um, again, the topic the panel will be uh, discussing is understanding and coexisting in an intergenerational workplace. That being said, I'd like to have our panelists introduce themselves, um, the agency that you represent, and why you feel an integrational workplace is important. My name is Chandra Bell. I am the Director of Career Services at Columbus State Community College. And why I think um, intergenerational workplace is important in today's um, society is uh, people are working longer. Um, and we are going to need to learn to respect the differences um, that are in the workforce today. And so I think that working with our students at Columbus State, we have a wide range of students who are there who represent really the intergenerational um, topic that we're covering today. And so making sure that we're able to equip those students with the resources that they need to be effective in the workplace. Excellent. 
Excellent. I don't know how to follow that. Uh, <laughs> hello, everyone. My name is Teresa Ferguson. I work for Franklin County Department of Human Resources for the county commissioners. The reason why um, I think that intergenerational workplace is important is because <clears throat> it bridges the gap between the one generation to the next, and you reap the benefits, the employers reap the benefits of having a more happy workplace. The, uh, the, work, the workers reap the benefits of having high morale and less stress. So that's why I love talking about generations in the workplace, uh, what we can learn from each other, what we can share, talking about those core values, and I know we'll get into that a little later, but talking about core values and how they differ doesn't mean they're one's right or one's wrong, they're, they're just different. And so bringing all those things together makes me so interested in talking about generations in the workplace. Good afternoon. I'm Joe Youngs. I'm the director with Business Solutions with Ohio Means Jobs, Columbus, Franklin County. And a lot of you may hear us refer to as COIC, so we're one in the same. And um, I feel this topic is uh, a really important one in that each generation brings uh, unique skill sets to the workplace. And I think just kind of honing those and, and knowing how to address um, each set of skill sets just makes the workplace holistically uh, a better place to be. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sandra Kellum. I'm with the Ohio Department of Commerce. Um, and I just want to say that it's a little bit different than the Chamber of Commerce. We are a state agency. We um, regulate up to uh, seven different divisions. And so um, just wanted to clarify that because I do get questions about that. But the reason why I think this is important, we, uh, I'm the HR director, we support close to 900 employees in our agency. And um, we have at least four generations in our workforce. Um, that spanned from people being there from six months to 47 years. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very important topic in that um, it's one element of diversity that we not only have to uh, embrace, but I think it's an opportunity for us to understand each other, understand uh, the different viewpoints, the world views of each generation, and be able to create a cohesive work environment. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Beth Flynn, and I'm from the Ohio State University Leadership Center, and I am a leadership consultant and trainer. And why this topic is important to me, I'm going to piggyback on what Sandra said about multi-generations or different generations are just one small part of what makes us rich as a uh, workforce. And we have to look at, we have an aging workforce, that is staying longer and has a lot of wisdom. And we have a new workforce coming in, the millennials, who now are 50% of the employees in organizations. So we have a lot to do with understanding each other so we all can work together. I guess, Dr. Bell, I'll just refer to you if you don't mind to answer intergenerational and then what categories fall under the intergenerational in regards to the workplace? Intergenerational kind of speaks to the different generations um, who are employed um, for our topic um, in the workforce. And so if we look at the baby boomers, and I know that the when I did some research on this, some of the ages are a little bit different, but they're approximately 51 to 70 years um, old. Uh, then you have your Gen Xers, I fall kind of into that category, um, and they're the folks who were born um, between 61 and 81, and so they're about 34 to 54. Then we've got the Millennials, let me look at their age, um, but born between 75 and 95 um, approximately, and so they're around 20 to 40 years old. Would anybody like to add anything in regards to that? Okay. Um, just a, uh, we wanted a better definition, a, a more precise definition of intergenerational and want to make sure that we understand the categories that fall into intergenerational. Yes, I agree with uh, Dr. Bell. Um, and then there's also um, the uh, World War um, II generation 
Um, and there are different models, as she said. These are the folks um, who were born 1945 and prior. Um, sometimes they're called the traditionalists or the builders, or um, you may hear them called the depression babies or the GI Joes. Um, she already mentioned the baby boomers, the Gen X, and the millennials. So there's, um, in a lot of different models, you see at least four different generations in a lot of workplaces. Those are the generations that you'll see. Great, thank you. Um, and we're just gonna go down the line. Um, so, Dr. Bell, what, what can an agency do, or what does your agency in particular do to promote an intergenerational workplace? I think the very nature of Columbus State, um, in terms of who we serve, um, represents kind of the intergenerational um, culture. Uh, we have uh, students who come to us um, as early now as um, high school, uh, soon to be middle school. Um, we have um, employees who range, you know, from those students or, or, or employees who are coming right from high school who are getting uh, jobs uh, right out of high school. And then we've got folks who have, are a little bit more seasoned, who've gone to college um, and are working in the workplace. And so I think um, making sure that we understand, um, as my colleague uh, mentioned earlier, that there are differences um, within um, Columbus State, making sure that we respect uh, those differences, uh, I think is important. And also, as Sandy said, is that we can learn from uh, one another um, in this space. And so some of what we do um, specifically in career services is that we try to make sure that we identify those uh, different populations um, as it relates to uh, differences. And so we will have uh, different types of fairs for students. Um, and so not necessarily in the generational space, but really more in the diversity space of making sure that we are uh, identifying differences. And so we'll have career fairs that relate to folks with disabilities, people who have been incarcerated. Um, and within that framework, you're going to have different uh, age groups that are represented in each of those. We have a um, diversity department who works specifically in that area, again, more broadly around the topic of diversity, where they try to identify different needs um, of our students um, and employees. And so I think that um, in the larger context, we do um, work with students, but not a targeted approach to say that we're working specifically with intergenerational uh, populations. Okay, thank you. Teresa, you're with Franklin County. Um, any insight as to how do Franklin County helps to promote an intergenerational workplace? Well, the, uh, the Franklin County Department of uh, employment development, I'm a part of that department and I'm a trainer and so we offer courses to our employees um, as staff development. Uh, one of them is called Valuing Diversity in the Workplace and uh, another one is called Valuing Generations in the Workplace. So then we also encourage our managers and our supervisors to have dialogue and have meetings and discussions with their staff regarding generations if they're facing any challenges. Um, what are the benefits of having a four generational workplace. So that's pretty much it. Okay, that's enough. Joe, how about you? It's kind of two-pronged what I'd like to share, first okay. of all, internally within um, our organization and uh, then with the uh, uh, customers that we work with. But internally, we have um, the number of millennials that are joining our staff has been increasing over the last couple of years. And so just what we do is look at um, what their, where their interests lie. They like to uh, experience new things and use technology. And really as an organization, we should be using more technology. So in the last couple of years, we've really um, uh, got more into uh, social media as a result of having millennials on our team. But um, it's also helped us as an organization as, our, as far as reaching out and, um, on, and marketing our services. But we do, I am seeing that there's a lot of things that are kind of slowly changing because we have millennials on our team and it's really um, benefiting us as far as advancing the organization. But the other side of that is uh, we work with uh, job seekers and preparing them, um, be it uh, they need training or um, having or, uh, events such as the doctor mentioned. 
And um, when we have certain events, we try to make sure if they're focused events, that the staff that's um, facilitating are familiar with that uh, group that's being um, hosted. And we have a summer program called Soar Higher, and that's a program that's primarily focused on folks from the age of 14 to 24 years of age. Right now we're having um, work readiness workshops and uh, job expos planned for the segment of that group from the ages of 18 to 24 years of age. So with our workshops, we're incorporating our millennial team to facilitate because who better for uh, that group to really listen and really kind of take in uh, what's being told, by, told to them than folks that look like them. So it's been very successful. As a matter of fact, um, uh, some of the older folks, and I'm not one, but uh, <laughs> have been asked to, have been told that, you know, by the millennials, we have this, you don't even have to worry about it, we'll facilitate everything, and it's been very successful. So um, right now in our agency, what we're doing is we're providing training for all of our supervisors. We believe that the change has to stop, start from the top and trickle down, and and the training uh, is not only about embracing each other's differences in terms of the physical appearances, but how people uh, prefer to communicate, how they prefer to interact. Um, once the manager can create an environment of um, accepting how people like to communicate and interact with each other, um, that includes at the fo folks who may fall into a different generation. Um, one of the things that I've learned even about the diversity um, it's not enough just to say that we have a diverse environment. Um, we have to also be inclusive. So that means um, widening the circle. I have a good friend who uses this analogy that when she walks into the room, she's an African-American female who is also um, of a certain age. She falls into the baby boomer um, category. But when she walks into the room, um, and if it's homogenous, immediately the room becomes diverse. Um, but if there are circles of people who are having conversation and they don't broaden back to include her into the circle, the room is diverse but not inclusive. But once the circle steps back and, and, and bites her into the conversation, then it becomes inclusive. So that's what we've been trying to train our managers, not only to diversify, because you can diversify, but you also need to be inclusive of everybody's differences, their viewpoints, um, the generations, they have a different view uh, based on the era that they were raised in, um, and so that needs to be included. Everyone may not see things the same way, and sometimes that's where the conflict could come in because you have different viewpoints, different world views, uh, different experiences. So we try to be uh, embracing of that and inclusive of that difference. <laughs> Beth, how about you? Well, I know that the university, the career services work with the preparing the millennials for their jobs, and we do have an office of diversity and inclusion. But my role is different than most of the universities. I am not focused on students. As part of the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences, we are required to do outreach as part of a land grant university. And that was th that every state has was given land to provide education to the public. And so that's part of my role. And so what I see a lot within my college is we're doing a lot of training around working with the multi-generations because each generation is different based on the historical events that happened during their generations. So we have a vast we all have a vast variety of experiences and we bring those into the workplace and we need to understand and benefit from that. I work, also I do a lot of work with managing multiple, or excuse me, managing millennials because millennials are the most misunderstood generation in the workforce. And each generation when they came into the workforce was the least understood. So it's hard, it's, we, it's important that we educate people about what works, what doesn't work, understanding the generations. And another thing that we really work on in my college is 
beyond training is to put together intergenerational work teams, leadership teams, and that seems to help with dealing with the conflict that may occur in the generations since they don't understand each other. Great, thank you. Um, how does the workplace benefit from having a multi-generational generational, um, workforce and how does it promote a positive experience for both the employee and the employer? So the, the first part again was how do we benefit from having... Yeah, how does the workplace benefit by having a multi-generational workforce? I, I think um, what we kind of shared uh, earlier is really this the diversity of thought um, and so that you um, learn from different perspectives um, that are there and I think it's also important to note um, that just because you're in a generation doesn't necessarily mean that you have that mm -hmm. same world view. And so I think that oftentimes we are, we mistakenly kind of just assume that a person is, since you're um, a millennial, that you think a certain way, and that's not always true. We've heard of people with old souls, and so that they may think a little bit different than some of the other folks that um, are in the room. And so I think that really at the core of it, um, we benefit again by making sure that we are aware, that we respect, and that we engage um, with those different um, personalities that are in the, the circle in the workplace. And then the second part of your question? Um, how does it promote a positive experience for both the employee as well the employer? I think for the employee um, is, it's helpful to understand that um, I'm being heard, I'm being validated, and I'm being um, understood. And so if I recognize that my employer and my colleagues are respecting me for who I am, then my strengths are able to resonate with that company, with that organization, and I'm able to flourish. And I think on the, the other end of that for the employer, they're able to benefit because the student, or I'm sorry, the employee is going to actually um, hopefully be retained and they won't have to continue to refill a position. So it would help with retention of keeping those employees um, in that area and also making sure um, that we've got folks in the right seat, I think, is, is another um, important factor. Great, thank you. So, Teresa, and I'll repeat the question. Mm -mm, um, she said it all. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. How many people? I do think that there are some uh, benefits to be gained, um, as we had mentioned before, an inclusive work culture um, environment, enhanced recruitment, um, retention, and profitability. Um, the benefits of having a multi-generational work team includes attracting and retaining uh, talent from people of all ages, all races, um, various genders, um, well, the two genders, uh, flexible work team, and stronger decisions are made based on um, the multiple perspectives that you get from having such a diverse team. Um, you're gonna get more creativity um, and innovation. I think when uh, one of the things that we talk to our leaders about is you may have people, you may have a project that needs to be done and, and you may know what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. But what I found in my experience even though I may know how to do it, when I give it to someone else, maybe a millennial or a, a Gen X, nine times out of 10, they come back with a better product than I could ever even imagine. So it's you know, allowing, to foster, uh, allowing us to foster the creativity and the innovation um, of folks who bring that to the table. And as leaders and, and managers, we have to be comfortable leveraging that and allowing people to know more uh, than we know, and learning from the people that um, may be a direct report from you. Um, and then the other thing is the team, um, when it's a multi-generational uh, work team, um, they're prepared to meet the needs of a more diverse public and can relate uh, to their customers in a more efficient way. Uh, working with the county, com from the county's perspective, we have 11 agencies that are under us, um, under the Board of Commissioners. And one of the benefits that a multicultural, diverse 
generation, I'll say that word five times real quick. <laughs> what that brings to the work benefits is that you get the benefits of experience mixed with youthful knowledge. You get an opportunity to open doors with for team building. You get increased productivity, higher morale, less stress. I can go on and on and on. But the benefit is the benefit of technology and knowing that we can all get along. We can all bring something to the table. Every need is supplied and you can get what you need from your workforce. And people will stay longer if they're happy. <laughs> if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Yeah, if you're happy, you will stay. You will, you will retain that employer, employee. And that saves money. And it equals money in the long run. Long term effects is money. Sorry, I, I, I might not have said, should have said money, but okay. <laughs> Just to add one thing is when you build multi-generational teams and people understand each other and the organization really listens and thinks about what the needs are of the employees and like Sandra said before, multi-generation issues are just one part of who we are. But when we are heard and feel like we are part of the organization and understand exactly what our need, what our jobs are and have the right equipment, then we have, the employees are more engaged. And you want engaged employees because engaged employees will give more time and will give up to, the research shows that they will do an extra three hours a week of productivity, productivity productive time and that is not that they work you work extra hours but that the time that you are at work is spent being busy and not playing on playing angry birds or whatever people do <laughs> and so with a satisfied employees brings more productivity for the organization and that's what the benefit is yes. What I have to add really kind of echoes what the rest of the panelists said, but um, internally in our culture, whenever we have any type of uh, initiative, it's looked at as all hands on deck. And as Sandra mentioned earlier, when you have a, a team that, that's representative of all the generations, it just really ends up being a much better product. It's not um, the same thing you did yesterday. If you're doing the same thing you did yesterday, you're going to get the same results internally and externally. So uh, we do find now that, as I mentioned earlier, we're really embracing and um, uh, using social media. We have equipment in the building, new equipment, video equipment that half of us don't know how to operate, but when we have guests, we really have stepped up our ante as far as um, our branding because of what the millennials have you know, made uh, us aware of. But it's just so, um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention too, and listen everyone, I kind of started thinking about um, having succession plans. Um, organizations having succession plans for folks that uh, to replace folks that are retiring maybe not so much here in the room in the organizations that we represent but um, with a lot of uh, employers that we work with Lynn Espy she's in the audience we talk with employers all the time about um, you know folks aging out and having folks prepared to be in those spots so part of the succession plan for business businesses should be taking advantage and bringing those folks in so that they can learn what needs to be done after you're not there and just to piggyback off of that real quick I pulled up a, a statistic and 78 million boomers will be facing retirement in the next couple of years so you're absolutely right about that succession planning so that's actually a really good segue into my next question because we're talking about internally what we're doing uh, with our multi-generational workforce. Um, can you provide me with some recruitment practices that are being used to create intergenerational workforces? Are there any best uh, practices? And because we had talked about bringing new folks in. To be honest, um, on, from the recruiting standpoint, at least my experience, uh, more of the challenges as far as talking with employers and encouraging them to um, take on a, a, a new employee is more on this, the side of uh, the boomers because 
I hate to, to, to use this word of discrimination, but it's challenges. The boomers are finding more and more challenges in um, landing um, self-sufficient wage uh, employment because the employers are more apt to want to have a fresh, what they perceive as a, a, a millennial or Generation X coming in because they have fresher ideas, they're easier to mold. So right now, there's really a lot of challenges on that end because, as you mentioned, folks are working longer. Um, folks that have um, retired are coming back in to the workplace for, for different reasons. One, because they just want to keep busy. Others, because they have to. And um, so the recruiting piece can get very, very challenges, challenging, but those that are, are in that space of, of recruiting have to really be aware of all the things that we're talking about, you know, all the different, um, different uh, ways that those different generations think and what motivates them. It's just a lot. And I was sitting here thinking, too, that maybe uh, this may be the first time um, in history, maybe, that it's been so many ages, age groups, looking for employment together at the same time, or so many different age groups still in the workplace together. Because the trend was, at least, um, you know, when I was younger and with my parents, that you only worked a certain amount of time, you retired and made the way for, you know, the young folks that came in, didn't even have to really take a lot of time preparing them for the spot, but the trend has really changed, so it's a lot of challenges now. I guess I would add to that, um, a focus that we're moving towards at Columbus State is really looking at an intra, um, or an industry-centric um, model and working with um, professionals. Um, and a part of that is actually including having um, employer panels. And so we're doing more of the employer engagement. And so we're trying to understand what employers are looking for. We hear a lot about the skills gap that um, we're not preparing students um, for the workforce. And so what we're trying to do is to listen to what the employers are needing as it relates to their industry. And what I've heard from some of the different panels that we've had is that a lot of them are really open to hiring any and everyone because they need the bodies in, in, the, um, in, the, play, in the workforce. And so, so for them, we're trying to make sure that we hear from them. And then the other side of that is making sure that we are making sure that we have our students prepared for what the employers are looking for. And so, that is uh, having career panels um, so that they can actually hear from the employers and engage with employers one-on-one -on -one so that they're actually clear about what the expectations are. I mean, I have, um, in the time that I've been at Columbus State and, um, and been in this profession, kind of had my own worldview of what my professionalism is and what my expectations are. And I see now that the trend is actually shifting a little bit, you know, in terms of the expectations and um, in terms of what professionalism is. We had a advisory committee who come in um, who worked with a couple years ago, and we talked a lot about um, tattoos and things like that that are really different from my generation in terms of what the norm is, what's acceptable, and what's um, expected. And so I think making sure that we're able to speak to, again, this has to do with the intergenerational piece, the diversity and kind of what's the norm for them, that for me is, you know, it's not good. Um, and so the, the other point that we, we came up with is, you know, after a student has a tattoo, it's really too late to talk to them about, you know, you having this tattoo. And so how do we work with students kind of on the front end? How do we work with employers in terms of deciding what would be um, beneficial bo on both ends of that. So panels and employer engagement, I guess, making sure that both student and um, employers are understanding the needs um, both ways. Great, thank you. Any other comments? Um, I, I was just going to um, go back to the recruiting and retention. One of the challenges, I work in a, a public um, state agency where um, we compete with the private and corporate sectors and so recruiting is always a challenge when you're talking about salary 
and, and so we have to um, come up with creative ways of attracting uh, people from all generations um, and come up with different methods because technology has added an extra layer of, um, you know, uh, method of how we need to communicate and interact with potential applicants and candidates. For the World War II, those that fall 1945 and, and prior, if they're in the workforce, um, they have a certain preference of how they want to be communicated with, generally speaking. Um, to Dr. Bell's point, everybody is not this way because there are a lot of people, you know, grandparents who are on social media and, and they're pretty tech savvy too. Um, but generally speaking, um, you know, you, you, this group prefers a more personal, face-to-face uh, -face kind of interaction. Then you have the baby boomers, and I fall into that group, and I'm proud to say I'm a baby boomer. But times have shifted, and so as we go out and we start looking for um, employment, we want more time with our families. We do still want to make a uh, meaningful and purposeful contribution to the workplace. We want to make a difference but at the same time, we want that flexibility. Um, we like the telecommuting. We like having the adjustable work schedule. Um, and we were talking earlier about the Gen Xs. It's like, tell me what you need me to do, um, and then basically get out my way and let me do it. FaceTime in the workplace today does not equal productivity. Um, and I tell my, the people that I work with, just because you're here eight hours a day doesn't mean that you're producing. Um, today, with devices and technology, you can almost work anywhere. You can work from your car. If you're putting out, I mean, you're putting in your time, you know, you're putting in your 40 hours a week, and to your point, engaged employees are more productive, and sometimes they will give more. Um, that, I think, is the recruiting tool. So one of the things that we we are discussing right now is how do we recruit total reward package, the salary, um, you know, time off, leave time is important to a lot of the generations from, from the traditionalists all the way to the millennials. Uh, the millennials, they love the technology. They love to be able to share information. And, and so when we are recruiting for them, they are also looking uh, from what our experience has been, how do I get mentored so that I can develop and grow and progress through the organization? So, one last point, I guess I wanted to add. I'm sorry. Um, was in your marketing materials? That's another way that you would actually want to um, reflect that you're actually open to an intergenerational um, um, workforce um, mm -hmm. and community. And so, if you're doing brochures and things like that, that you would have the representation of you know the different age groups that are there and so have some folks with gray hair have some folks who are a lot younger that sort of thing so it it seems to be a welcoming um, environment so that was just something I thought of as Sandy was speaking I do training <laughs> I don't have to recruit students <laughs> or employees or yes employees um, so that was an easy question to answer um, so we talk about the recruitment process and creating an inclusive environment. Once we've created that inclusive, multi-generational environment, how do we blend the skill sets of the different generations in that particular workplace? With I think that's an intentional effort, and I think someone mentioned it earlier um, as they talked about work teams, and so that if you're cognizant and, and really are intentional, if the organization is intentional about making sure that they want to bring out the best and have um, a, a variety of perspective represented on a project or um, a team is that you have different um, skill sets in different generations on a specific project so that you can actually um, build a whole, I think that Sandy was talking about earlier. So I think it's something that has to be forefront of the um, employer's mind that this is what we're intentionally trying to do. Um, and you also have to socialize that concept with the employees who are working there because 
I think the other part of that is um, kind of what we haven't really talked about the elephant in the room is sometimes we don't like working with people who are different from us and so it's usually easier to go um, along the path of least resistance if I know that this group of folks think like me I'd rather do that and get the project done but we would have to make sure that we're doing training um, for the employees. I think some of the groups have already done this so that they are preparing um, you know, the, the different departments um, to work with the different uh, generations. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else, Teresa? I was just gonna say, just continue to have seminars like this after you built your workplace and invite your staff to come out to um, like our participants in the audience. Um, having dialogue to figure out what the strengths and the challenges are in the workforce as far as the multi-generational. Also, what did I, oh yeah, and define these terms. Define terms like professionalism and diversity. Don't be scared to talk about diversity and race and culture and differences and core values. Define respect. Make these uh, terms become part of your agency's policies and procedures where you're communicating them, implementing them in, across the border. It'll make your employees much happier, more diverse, and you can start talking about, well, you remind me so much of my grandmother, or, oh, you remind me of my son, and then bringing that all together in the workforce and just making it work, being more productive, team building. I love doing team training, talk about team building, and that's where you get all those generationals together, all the uh, diversity, and put it all on the table and just go for it. And that's what it's about, and that's, that's what you can do once you build that workforce. Great, thank you, Bill. Um, just to kind of build on what I mentioned about earlier and um, having a full representation on, uh, as a team on different initiatives, um, I think, First of all, again, as Sandra mentioned earlier, you end up with a much better product, but I think it also um, indirectly changes the culture, and folks don't even really realize what's going on, it's changing the culture, and what I see, even myself, you know, with, when you come together as a team, you realize each other's value and skill sets that, that you bring, and you find yourself going to that uh, millennial saying, can you show me, how do I click, what do I do? Don't tell nobody, you know? <laughs> so I, I just think it just kind of naturally, um, in a lot of cases, can just kind of change the culture where, you know, you, you wake up one day and you're thinking, you know, I really didn't want that young young person really even being part of the team. What, what were they even gonna bring? Or are they trying to move me out? Or, you know, those sorts of things. But then when you come together as a team naturally and really realize what you can do together holistically, it's made a difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I will ditto um, everything that um, the panel has said thus far. Um, one of the things that I think um, it's also been helpful uh, in my experience is just putting people on teams together um, who may not necessarily gravitate to each other because as uh, Dr. Bell said, people tend to gravitate to um, what's comfortable. Uh, and so I, I love putting teams together, people who may have um, just different personalities, different perspectives, different skill set, and that creates um, you know, a, a totally different work environment. Um, I have a millennial that works in our office and I'll start like a project and do what I think is such a fantastic PowerPoint. And then, you know, I'll just ask him to like, can you just add a design to it? And oh my gosh, it'll come back and it looks like somebody's professional's done it. So um, not being afraid to reach out and ask someone else who might have a different skill set and um, just kind of a different perspective. But, and also mentoring. I think it's important to get those um, cross generations together. Uh, maybe have a millennial work with a baby boomer or a traditionalist um, and have them learn from each other. Um, so that the millennial gains a, a totally different perspective about the world and the experience and the knowledge. Um, and then the traditionalists can learn a little bit more about, you know, the technology because um, the millennials have grown up with the internet. Um, 
I remember Dr. Harrison telling us about an example of when he, he took his kids to, I think it was somewhere in California, and they happened to see a phone booth. And then they asked the question, what is that? <laughs> so, you know, they have grown up with the technology, and um, so they have a lot to offer. They're smart. They're very uh, informational, um, wise. I mean, if, if there's something they don't know on their smartphones, they're Googling it. So um, we can learn, I think, from, from all of the generations. Thank you, Beth. I think that everything needs to be intentional, that management and leadership needs to make this a priority and keep the communication flowing. Because as Dr. Bell mentioned earlier, that these are generalities of, an, of a generation, um, but we don't want to stereotype anybody because of that. And to piggyback on what Sandra was saying about the mentoring, we do have reverse mentoring in my organization. And what we do is we take our seasoned employees and they can share the institutional knowledge and then they can benefit from the millennials with their tech savvy. And as Sandra said, they did grow up with this. And so they are very comfortable. And we, the rest of us had to adopt and, and learn more about technology. And so that's, that's what it's really about. Um, another discussion needs to be um, workplace expectations. We can't give somebody certain benefits or certain perks because of their generation. Each generation or everybody in the organization needs to be treated fairly. Oh, one more thing. <laughs> It, it is easy to work with people who are just like us, personality-wise, generational-wise, whatever it is. And it's really scary as I look at organizations and I'm working with them because we're promoting the same type of people and we never change. And I call it drinking the Kool-Aid or Stepford Wives because we keep hiring the same types of people because that's where we're comfortable. Great, thank you. So instead of drinking the Kool-Aid, <laughs> we are intentionally attempting to create multi-generational multi workplaces. What are some of the trends, either positive or negative, that we're, we're seeing in the workplaces? I think some of them we've, we've shared um, in terms of the uh, innovation with some of the, the younger folks in terms of how um, uh, they've grown up in a technology-driven uh, world, and so for them, um, we are able to see and create and do things that we probably um, wouldn't have imagined doing um, before, doing things uh, differently with PowerPoints, with presentations, with interacting with people. Um, so I think in a positive way, um, the technology um, has improved what we do. I think. It's also careful, or we should also be careful, even with the technology, that sometimes we can overly rely on that versus us actually thinking. And this is where I think for some of the, um, the boomers would probably have issue with um, everything being done so fast, so quick, so without giving really much thought to um, what's going on. And I don't know in a, a millennial's mind if they think that they haven't given thought because it's there, it's quick, and it's just a different way of thinking about it. But I think there is still a certain mythology to thinking through the steps, thinking about how this impacts your long-term um, objectives. And I think that, um, that is to be respected, I think, in many ways from some of our boomers. And so I think in many ways, again, technology has helped, but we also should make sure that we're also still thinking um, and critically thinking about what it is we want to do and what the objectives are of the organization. Um, so I guess I'll leave it. Great, thanks. Yeah, Teresa. Uh, just to add, piggyback on that, the, I see uh, it being a positive trend is the acceptance, the inclusiveness, and just a more diverse work environment. Well, um, to, to not uh, put be a Debbie Downer on um, this question, but because of the, and not everyone's the same, because I have a, a, a millennial on my team that's like an old man, so I kind of um, 
engage him to help me with the other millennials to get them engaged. But just kind of looking at the, the kind of identified um, things about the different generations, like baby boomers are very competitive, naturally very competitive. And um, the gener Generation X, they like flexibility. And they like, someone mentioned they like to just get the assignment and go on and do it and, and keep on rolling. Where with the, the baby boomers, we want feedback. We want to know what's going on step by step. You know, just check in. So just in those kind of areas, it, it kind of some generational issues because we all have different ways of how we do our work. So I have a person on my team, he's a millennial, and um, I gave him a, a, an initiative that was pretty, that is pretty high profile in the organization. That's another thing. They don't want like real lightweight, easy okay. stuff that, you know, not, all of us want to be noticed, so that's across all the generations. So don't just give them the busy work and be just to help you get through what you have to do. So anyways, I, I asked this uh, gentleman to give me an update on you know, how things have been going. It's all done. It's all done, Joe. I've done everything. Why are you, um, um, what's the word for it, when you really are trying to make sure that everything's done? Well, anyways, don't. Yes, you don't have to do that, Joe. I said, well, you know, I really kind of need to, to report back. This is an mm -hmm. initiative that is really, you know, I'm leading. So can you give me just a little bit of feedback? So if I'm asked, is it okay, is it not, then I feel comfortable with that. So just really kind of different work techniques or work approaches, mm -hmm. I see that as kind of an issue with the generations. Um, some of the trends that... Um we've seen and some that I've read about include when we've talked about the generations are already working side by side in our organizations we have at least like I say four generations um, but you also hear that competition for talent is increasing um, one of the things that AARP put in their survey and, and you can look this up they've got a wonderful publication on leading multi-generational um, teams but one of the things that tops the list of most um, organizations is it's finding the talent. There's a war for the talent. The cost of replacing an experienced worker, someone who's been in an organization for 30 or 40 years, runs from 50 to 150 percent of that person's salary. So, um, so it's, it is a business imperative. The productivity and the business results that we talked about earlier are linked to the environment. They're linked um, because frustration and conflict can come if there's not a cohesion in terms of teamwork and communication um, and valuing um, the differences that each individual brings to the organization. So uh, competition for the talent, more generations are working side by side and uh, it's important to the work environment, uh, including productivity and um, bottom line revenue. On the positive side, um, we look at the different generations and what their work needs are. And boomers live to work. And Xers and millennials work to live. I was getting that confused. And so that's bringing in about some conversation and looking at how we should work, defining what is success. As Sandra said before, is it FaceTime or is it productivity? And we need the flexibility because we have lives and we have access to technology 24 hours a day. And so some of us, if we're not careful, can work 24 hours a day. Um, some of the negative trends that I'm, I'm noticing is we have a large number of people who can retire and we can try in the next 15 years up to 50% of our working population. And many organizations have not done the succession planning to replace these people who are leaving, gain, learning and gaining their institutional knowledge that's in their head and not in files, and also training upcoming leaders so they are ready to take the, the role of those who are retiring. And one other thing that comes to mind about a negative trend is we're dealing with millennials who have grown up with helicopter parents. Their parents have done everything they can to solve the issues for their children. And so many of our, 
our millennials are coming into the workforce not knowing how to solve problems. We've had people in interviews, if they did not get the job, their parents call. And, it's, and so that's a serious issue because we need problem solvers. We need people who can take the lead on things and not have to be handheld. The other thing is that um, we are the trophy gener the millennials are the trophy generation. They showed up and they got a ribbon. And so when they're in the workplace, they need lots of recognition and constant feedback of how good am I doing. And my niece said to me once, my boss hasn't taken me out to lunch for a week. I don't think she likes me anymore and I don't think she thinks I'm doing a good job. And I'm like, what? And so it's just different expectations. And that's why these discussions about multi-generations in the workplace are so important so we can benefit from, the, from what's good about each generation rather than the negativity that people see at the generations. What she was saying uh, regarding the, the, you know, the, the millennials, the, the Gen Xs, uh, the interaction in the workplace, and one of the things that I always share is that you know, employees leave, um, they join organizations, but they leave supervisors. Supervisor is really the key um, to uh, creating a certain type of environment in the workplace. Um, I always promote one-on-ones. I think it's important, even if supervisors just have five to 10 minutes with an employee, they learn about that employee, they build a relationship. Um, if your supervisor doesn't schedule one-on-ones, take the initiative and do it yourself so that you can learn your supervisors, get an understanding of what the expectations are. I think that's really important um, because at the end of the day, it's, it's the supervisors ultimately uh, the key to maintaining um, you know, a work environment that's conducive to um, embracing the differences that, that can occur. Just to add to that, <clears throat> uh, managers, they do need to know who they're managing. And so they do have to spend that time, as you mentioned. And um, part of that knowing is knowing what motivates, because different things motivate different people, obviously, and it doesn't matter what your age. But I, do, I wanted to add earlier that um, the statistic is that uh, Generation X and Millennials won't stick around very long. So we talked to, reten to the uh, retention issue. They won't stick around very long if um, they're not happy or if they're bored. So just making sure that you have um, activities in place to keep them engaged. Really all employee employees engaged, but particularly because they don't, they're not really of the mindset that they owe anyone anything. It's kind of all about them. Well, for some of us too, but I just wanted to add that part. <laughs> and that's, that's real good and important because I remember when I was in my 20s and 30s, my priorities were different. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, it was about work. It was about coming to work, doing a good job, showing up, giving that extra hour. Now, <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> no, but um, <laughs> now my priority is my family. So that's shifting. And we have, to, we have to remember as um, agencies, managers, supervisors, coworkers, it, to understand that your priorities change as you're going through the workforce, as the years are getting added on. And as new people are entering the workplace, that's important too because we don't want to change sometimes, but we got to remember that these processes that people that are coming into the organization, they, they could be good. See, I used to think I knew everything. I mean, I still do, kind of. But I found out that I didn't know everything, and that was a beautiful thing. So just, just realizing all that and getting that to work and hand by hand, hand, you know, side by side in the workplace is very important. But I like what you said, the managers, the supervisors, the agencies, they have to want that to happen. They have to be inclusive. They have to be willing to step outside the box and still get that knowledge for those for the people that have been in the organization. I know when I, I've been in my organization for 24 years, and I get very territorial when somebody new comes because I don't like change. <laughs> I want to do the same thing every day. <laughs> so I have to even remember to back up and to let go and to accept and be inclusive. So just talking about it, having a dialogue. Seminars like this are so, so very important. 
one other thing I guess I would add to the conversation about millennials, I think the at the core, it really is the same for all of us because I really do believe we're more alike than we are different. Um, I think the way they express their need is different than past generations. Because if you think about even the boomers and um, probably even folks from the depression area that Sandra spoke of, um, we all have a internal sense um, and need to be understood and respected and, and, and heard. Now, how that's actually communicated out to other people may be different than the millennials, and I think that they're more um, cold or over with how they express that. But the expectation for um, boomers is that you are loyal to the employer, you are empl um, to the, your boss, and so that boss has an ego within himself that he is or she is wanting to have an agenda that's actually done. Now, the millennials, um, they don't really care about that, and so they'll leave, you know, and you know, go on to the next, um, you know, organization. But I think it's critical and important for us to understand that not much has changed, even though we're talking about the different generations. At our core, we're st still all individuals who have a certain need within us to be understood and heard and respected and validated and all those sorts of things. I think um, some of the, the literature kind of shares with us um, about the helicopter parenting that, you know, they were the first generation of chosen, um, where people chose to actually have kids. So as it relates to in vitro fertilization. So these folks are actually, I want them. And so that kind of goes with the, I want to make sure that I'm going to make sure I, you know, maintain or hold on to my investment. I've invested all this in you. And so I want to make sure that, um, you know, I'm taking care of you now the right way. So I think, again, just kind of at its core, um, if we think about it in terms of each of the generations, really think about it from an individual perspective that all of us actually have that need and that desire. Um, now, whether or not we act upon it because of financial situations, and I think that that's really what you have, is that for a lot of folks, they won't leave a company because mortgage kids and I've got all these different things. Sure, we'd like to leave like the millennials. They're living, you know, kind of a lot, a lot more freer than some of us. But I think that that same desire is probably within some of us, but we've been, our worldview is different in terms of how we see things. One other thing to mention is when we're talking about managers and everything, and each generation wants to be communicated with differently, we still need to look at how our manager wants to be communicated with. I don't think that I could text my boss um, and use just initials, or you are instead of your, because that's not how he expects to be communicated with. And so I think that we do need to uh, re respect our leadership and their expectations too, and not just have things done our way. Another one last thing about millennials is these people are leaving college with huge amounts of debt. And so they are laden down trying to pay off. They have to find a job that pays enough that they can pay off their student loans. And many of them have to move in with their parents. And so that changes. They want to be free and flexible and travel and do all these things, but they're laden with this debt. And one of the things that uh, the Board of Regents is looking at, and this is happening across the country, is making college affordable. In 1978, you could work a minimum wage job in the summer and that would pay for your college education. And that doesn't happen today. And so we need to look at that and their needs, and that's why they want a higher income. But who doesn't want a higher income? Um, with the aging folks aging out of the workplace, and then we have um, new folks entering into the workforce, um, some coming out of college, some coming out of high school, how um, are we preparing this younger generation to enter into a multi-generational workforce? Are we, are we doing anything specific? I know, uh, Dr. Bell, you had mentioned the tattoos. Well, once they have tattoos, it's, it's a little late to go back and retract and say, so are we doing anything on the forefront to work with the, the younger population? I think... Um that really is a, a shared responsibility, to be honest with you. I think that goes into parenting. Mm -hmm. I think it also goes into once they're um, in an institution of higher learning, if that's the route they've chosen, um, that 
there is contextual learning for uh, students so that they aren't just learning theory, um, but they're learning how to actually uh, engage with people and employers um, once they are in the workforce. And so um, preparing those students by way of whether it's pre presentation skills, having them present, um, knowing things like that, um, having them working on teams, as, we, as we've mentioned before, um, are different ways, methods that we can actually help those students. But I honestly do believe that the mentoring, the working with folks on teams, all of that secondary at its core, the responsibility of that, we're trying to take on roles that were never intended for us to actually fulfill. Right. Those are roles that were really um, designed for parents to actually do some of that shaping, that molding. And of course, it's going to be layered on by your other experiences, your education and your interactions with other people. So I think for some of us, um, that's been done. But for others, we're trying to play catch up and we're trying to, again, fulfill roles that really were never designed for us to fulfill. <coughs> What was the question again? I'm sorry. Um, when we're talking about aging out and then bringing new people into the workplace, okay. what type of preparation are we looking at? What are we doing, if anything? Um, COWIC, um, and I, she'll probably speak to this, uh, internships are very important because I just started thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Not only do we have four generations at our job, or we have five because we have a young intern that works mm -hmm. with us from the local school. So. Internships are very important. Going out to the community and talking about diversity and programming and processes, that's another thing. And I lost my train of thought on the last one, so I'll give it to the next panelist. Okay. Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> but yes, uh, as an organization, we are very involved in um, preparing the young folks that, that uh, we interact with for the world of work. And a big part when you talk with employers, uh, one thing that they'll talk about a lot and what they look for in a potential employee is not so much the hard skills, the technical skills, but looking at the soft skills, the um, <laughs> essential skills. You know, how do you work in the team? How do you deal with conflict? Are you able to professionally present yourself? Uh, so those sorts of things we really incorporate in our work readiness workshops. Uh, and really not just for uh, the young folks, but all of the job seekers we work with because there's uh, a lot of room for all of us to learn. You know, as Dr. Bell said, it's not, some things are just to the, you know, at the core level. Um, I did want to um, touch on the comment that you mentioned some, some of the young folks with the uh, debt from school living with their parents. And then, Doctor, when you mentioned, well, uh, some of this should be uh, kind of gleaned at home or from home. There's a lot of um, inter, uh, generational families right now. Maybe that could be another panel. <laughs> but, um, you know, so uh, we, we may be, maybe we're not really looking at what the Generation X and Millennials are coming with. You know, a lot of them already have experience because of their home life, their home world, in interacting with uh, folks from other generations. Um, Ms. Saunders? Yeah, you, you, you made me re realize something just now um, when you talked about um, intergenerational family. Um, I have an 83-year-old mom who lives with me. So she is a, uh, the traditionalist uh, born before 1945. And, you know, her viewpoint about certain things, totally different than my own. I'm a baby boomer. Um, and then I have four kids. Three of them are Gen Xs and one is a millennial. Um, and I always joke about this because I can text my millennial. No, I can call my millennial and he'll text me back. I can actually text my Gen X <laughs> and he'll, uh, if I call him, then he'll text me back and it's, it's just really different how they prefer to communicate. 
But I want to talk to you, talk a, a little bit about the internship because I think that is really important. My experience working with the interns, college students, it's really important. I'd always felt that um, my prior experience was at Columbus State, and I loved Columbus State because at one point um, I was able to work with some of the interns and the federal work study students. And uh, my philosophy about that was, you know, we give them a great opportunity to get an education. But I knew when I went through school, and I was a very late bloomer, um, and having graduated from college without the experience, you can't get a job. It was kind of like a double-edged sword. And so um, we worked with Dr. Bell's group to hire some federal work study students and uh, ended up getting the intern. And they didn't have uh, the experience to come in and do the job. And, and so I felt it was an opportunity for us to provide them with the experience, take the opportunity to coach them about professionalism, some of the important um, aspects of working in an office environment. Um, and I'm really happy to say today that they now work with me um, in my current environment. And um, it's, it's an opportunity to shape and mold um, that generation uh, not saying that they didn't get it at home, but because they went straight from high school to college, and you don't get that experience sometimes in college to know what's expected of an employer. And so my philosophy has always been to uh, hire for attitude, train for skill. Um, because if it's a technical skill and you have somebody that's willing and learning and they have the potential, um, then you can actually help that person develop and change a life. Um, if they have the willingness, that's always key too. Because even if someone does not have the skills coming in the door, um, look beyond the position that you're hiring for today and see where that person could be five years from now um, if they're you know, showing a willingness to uh, learn and grow and adapt. So. One thing that I think needs to be um, really, really stressed in college are leadership skills and supervisory skills. Because what happens is you're really good at your job, so we're going to make you a manager. And many times people are not equipped to be a manager, and they do not have the right leadership abilities to take on that management position. And so that's why this is very important. And then another thing is, how do you manage people who are older than you? because usually we're used to managing our peers. And so that's really, really something that needs to be focused on. I agree with everybody else about the soft skills uh, from problem solving, communication, uh, anything that can help them be successful in the workforce beyond their capabilities of the job. And one thing that I'm really concerned about with, with this generation is communication because they talk to who they want to talk to. This is happening with everybody. You take a break at a meeting and everybody pulls out their phone and checks their email or whatever they're doing. And one thing that I've really noticed on campus is everybody is, even when they're walking, they're texting. They always have the earbuds in their ear. And so they do not have the networking skills and the ability to talk to people, which is so vital. And so. I purposely ride the bus sometimes, and I'll sit by somebody with the earbuds in, and I'll just start talking to them, and I'll talk so much to them that they have to respond. But I feel like that's a lost art, and communication is so important, and so that's something that really needs to be stressed. Thank you. Um, I have one final question, then I'm going to open it up to the audience for some questions. Um, in creating an inclusive work environment, so we're forcing, we're, different generations are working together, how do we see that spilling over into community uh, interactions, um, is it, if that makes any sense? Is it impacting our community? Are we having better communication in neighborhoods? Do we suspect that we might have better neighborhood communication since we have intergenerational workplaces? I think it's like what she just said. Um, everybody's kind of into their own world with their earbuds. Um, and I see it even at work with 
people my age <laughs> walking and texting. I'm sort of kind of guilty of doing it too. But um, even in neighborhoods, you know, I think about where I live and um, pretty much it's, our street is very quiet. I think people, you know, I don't know if maybe because people are working longer and the air that we live in now, I almost feel like we're always on with mm -hmm. the technology. We always have our cell phones. We always have some iPad, some device that we're attached to. And depending on what kind of job you have, you're always on. I mean, even until 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. And then there's, of course, you know, the 24-hour TV with a thousand channels. I mean, you're, we're always on. And so it impacts the ability to be able to have meaningful uh, interactions with your family, with your friends, with your neighbors. Um, I could sit on my porch and maybe see two, three cars go down the street because usually people will go in through the back to go into their garage and close the door so you don't have that interaction. Now the kids are, some of the kids in the neighborhood are a little bit different because they're riding their bikes or they're riding their scooters and they'll come up. They, you know, if you got popsicles then you can have a whole bunch of friends. But um, yeah, I think in this day and age, uh, the, the technology, the devices, um, it's changed the way we interact with our neighbors, our friends and our family. I think um, at COIC, what we've, um, how we've grown as a team and what we've learned as a team has been impactful in the community because we do a lot of work in the community with different types of demographics, um, including, you know, intergenerational um, events. So I think that as a result of what we've learned together, we're able to better approach and uh, communicate with uh, different groups out in the community. So for instance, um, right now we're in the throes of the summer employment program, Soar Hire. So, um, and again, as I mentioned, that engages 14 to 24 year olds and their parents, depending on how, how old they are. And just knowing for each, uh, how that group looks that we're going out for that day, we can adjust to get the best results. I guess I, I don't want to be Debbie down on the last question, but I, I think a part of it um, too is um, making sure that again, we're intentional about what we're doing because I think that we can have events um, where we have different groups represented, but if the goal isn't established at the beginning that this is why we're doing it and this is the end result that we want to come up with, then I think that opportunities are missed in terms of what the um, event was for. And so I think about my own community. Um, and so we, there are different events that happen and you have this gathering of um, different people that are in attendance, but not necessarily engaging with one another. So you're there, but you're still not together. And I think someone brought that point up right. earlier. And so again, I think it has to be something that's very intentional in terms of what the outcome you're looking for. Can I just Thank say you. Please, go ahead. Just in addition to that, that is so true. Because we've been uh, planned events that we really didn't know our audience or maybe weren't as intentional as we should have been and they were a disaster. Mm -hmm. So that's really true. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I'm sure that in your neighborhoods growing up, everybody knew each other. And if you did something wrong, the parent could um, discipline you and that would be okay, whereas today that would not happen. It would be the child, it would be your fault, not the child's fault. I also think that our mode of transportation has changed things. We drive everywhere, so we're not walking, and so we're not running into people. On the other part, on the other side, with does this spill into our communities? Yes, I, I think it does, because when you're in a uh, in a club or organization and you're looking around and you see that there are not people from certain generations and because you're talking about that at work, you can point that out and try to recruit people from the different generations that aren't represented because there are some, a lot of clubs and organizations that are going to go away because they're not recruiting younger people and the younger people aren't interested in some of the clubs and organizations and the way they meet. So there's a whole different set of priorities. Right or wrong, I think it's something that we all need to look at. 
Thank you. And I was at one tiny thing to just kind of uh, piggyback on um, uh, what she just said here is the way we work nowadays. I can remember back in the day at the beginning of my career, we spent a lot of time traveling to and from to meet with customers and clients and uh, have meetings face to face. Now I do a lot of webinars. Everything is done over the computer, and so I think that impacts how we interact and communicate with each other as well. Do you have any other comments? Do we have any questions from the audience? We do. Okay. I have a question. On the scale there, I'm up at the top of the scale, so my question is this. I'm a thank you letter writer. Is thank you, are thank you notes still appropriate in the workplace, or do we just text? They're still appropriate. And, and expect um, we, and expect we, yeah, we have uh, COWIC thank you notes. Uh, uh, we do a lot via email, but we are encouraged to use those thank you notes. There's nothing like a handwritten thank you note for any generation. I, okay. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say I agree. Um, when we conduct interviews, I am still delighted when I get a card from the candidate thanking me. And I must say that even my grandkids who are 9, 10, uh, 14, and 18, they send thank you, handwritten thank you notes. So it's not a lost art totally. And I think that thank yous are very important. And not just thank you, but specifically for what you're thankful for, because it's much more meaningful. In my college, we're starting something that's called University U, and that's a way of employee to employee recognition. So it's not just top down, but everybody can recognize each other's good performance. Um, I also, while I'm up here, um, wanted to uh, let you folks know that we are our next Lunch and Learn is going to be on June 18th, I believe, 19th, June 19th, and it is going to be on education and volunteering op opportunities. And uh, believe it or not, there is a university here in Ohio that is an intergenerational intergener university. And there are courses in intergenerational. So if you can make it next time, we would love to see you. I uh, come from not an office perspective. I'm a mental health nurse and worked from the uh, state and, and all the hospitals, I think, in Ohio. But uh, one of my concerns uh, was that we assume so much about, not just about the different age groups, but about people's cultures. And so I wonder what that venue is where communication happens on that level of, of saying, I know this. And one of the strategies that we began to use was when I write something and think I'm communicating it to everybody to at least have two or three people that you run that by to see if you're saying what you think you want to say. So I wanted to address that piece. The other uh, piece uh, of culture, poverty versus the other uh, socioeconomic cultures that we were talking about, that that's a very different thing and I've was wondering about that within those workspaces that you're uh, speaking to. I'm trying to move to a first question about cultures and making the assumptions. I think we need to be intentional about every aspect of diversity culture, personality, generational, whatever it is, because once it's discussed and it's out on the table, then more and more things can be done around that. Um, poverty is an issue. I cannot speak enough about poverty to talk about the culture with poverty, but in the beginning, a lot of the early research on generations were on middle-class white Americans. And I guess I would just kind of go back, Gloria, to making sure that we actually um, seek to understand first because um, I think that that helps in making sure that you're actually communicating whether you miss the mark the first time you are at least making an effort to understand the other person's culture um, and values and where they're coming from and I think the other piece that I shared earlier is trying to make sure that you are at least aware 
that there are differences and that it's okay that we are different versus saying that I don't see it or you know, that sort of um, piece is that they're different and people like to um, be communicated to in different ways and so making the effort I think is, is awesome that you're doing that but as long as it's coming from a genuine space I think I think that that's all you can do and continue to learn and I think with intergenerational and diversity and this whole uh, conversation really that's at the core of it too is that we actually are comfortable with making sure that we are understood and are understanding other people but that we all have and can learn from other people that we don't know everything and it's okay that we don't know everything and so that's not the expectation is that we can always be lifelong learners. And I would just add, um, I think it's great that you share um, the correspondence with someone else just to get their perspective. I do that now and I would also just even say we communicate a lot through email and, and we have to be very, very careful. I'm always in conversations with folks about Email sometimes is great for sharing information, but not really a great tool for communicating because people may take what you're trying to yep. communicate to them um, in a um, uh, not a, a offensive way or an inoffensive way, but um, they may take offense to it and that was not your intent at all. And so um, I think we have to be, as someone said, very intentional about how we communicate, not just in normal correspondence, but email technology, text messaging um, as well. Thank you so much. Um, in light of time, I want to thank everybody, um, our panelists, as well as those in the audience. Um, I do want, yep. Um, please note that on October 3rd at the Downtown High School, we have a Neighborhood Best Practices Conference. Um, and there's a resource table in the back as well. Again, I'd like to thank our panelists. I do know that there were more questions in the audience, but we didn't have time for those. So I'd like to offer those in the audience, if uh, the panel is willing, to maybe get with them one-on-one -on -one and get those questions answered. Again, thank you so much, and everybody have a wonderful day.